I thought it appropriate, and I was praying about this, and I felt the Lord would have me speak on the subject, how to find the will of God. As a church, we're sort of on the, the doorstep of an important decision. And we want to try and find God's will. Over the years of being a Christian, and it, will, it is going on 45 years, it'll be 45 years at the beginning of April, 45 years I've been saved, I've always tried to find the Lord's will. And uh, over, the, over the years, I've uh, learned different scriptures. I've sat under some great preaching. I've read some great commentaries. And I've read the, the best book in the whole world, the Bible. And I've uh, searched it many, many times. And looking for how I can know the will of God. And I have for you six Six items. They're not steps, as in you take the first step and then you finish that and you go on to the second step. It's not like that. But there are six ways that we can test to find the will of God. A good analogy, which isn't so good anymore, uh, it's with the, uh, the, the shipyards and shipping and so on. Um, since modern days of GPS coordinates and things like that, no one uses lighthouses anymore. They're just decorative, pretty much. Uh, they don't need them. They've got GPS, and they've got all these maps and everything, and they can coordinate their, their way. They know exactly where they're at. It was only just a couple, three hundred years ago that uh, men would get lost at sea, trying to find their way from one continent to another, and tiny mistakes could, could set them miles and miles and miles away from their port. And finally, um, there was a man who invented a clock that was so precise to be used on board a ship. Because, you know, the ship motion of the ship would throw a clock off. And he invented one. It took him years to perfect it. He invented this. And with that, with the time... They were able then to get both longitude and latitude to know exactly where they're at. But still, um, they needed uh, help. And so there were uh, three types of, of lights that they used to use. One, of course, was the lighthouse. And the lighthouse would tell them where the land was. And there's the lighthouse over there. It's dark here. The lighthouse is there. The land is this way. And then they would come and they would want to go into the, the port or the harbor. Apparently, there are three types of uh, harbors. Um, one is for commercial uh, ships and things. Um, that would be including passenger ships. They would come and go out of these uh, commercial harbors. Then there were naval harbors just used by the government for the Navy. You weren't allowed to go in there. And then there was uh, a third kind that was uh, just used for refuge. Um, they had these out there, and they would chart them on their maps and so on. But three types of harbors. So uh, three types of lighting. One was the, uh, the lighthouse, and that shot the light way, miles way out into the ocean, and the, the ships could see it, and then they'd sort of steer toward the lighthouse. Well, as they got closer, they had the... Um, the lights along the shore on the inside of the harbor where they could see where the land was, the lights along the shore, otherwise they might go and crash into the shore so they could see those, har those, those lights. And then there was what they called harbor lights. And the harbor lights are what guided the, uh, the ship. Well, the ship guided itself, I guess, uh, according to the lights. But the way they would do it is they would set up the lights so that when the ship got to just a point where the lights lined up, then that was the best way to get into the harbor, the safest way so they wouldn't grind on a rock or something like that. And so they had these harbor lights. Um, these points that I'm going to share with you tonight are something like those harbor lights. And when you get them lining up, then you pretty know that pretty much know that you're, you're going the right way. 
I'm going to give you six of them. These six, you don't, it doesn't require all six in order for you to know the will of God. There will be times where you, it's impossible to have all six. But I suggest to you, you ought to have at least three of these six if you're going to determine the will of the Lord. Um, you know, I'm just assuming that uh, anyone who wants to really know the will of the Lord is first going to get their heart cleaned at the altar. That, uh, that I think, should be just basic. There's no way that God is going to show us His will if we've got dirty hearts. Uh, we don't, he, well, He doesn't want us to be clever devils. He doesn't want that. He wants us to be loving children. So we need to get our hearts cleansed and scrubbed by the Holy Spirit so that there's no sin in our hearts. And then using these six harbor lights, if you will, uh, you just start lining them up. And as I say, uh, sometimes you'll, you'll get uh, three, sometimes four, sometimes five. Rarely do I think you'll get all six, but they're there for you. And so I'm going to give them to you tonight. And uh, these can be applied to various circumstance, situation in your life. Uh, who do I marry? What job? What church? Um, where do I move to? What house? Th things like that, that we want to make decisions. You know, this car, that car, any car. W what, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? And it also applies to a church seeking to know God's will concerning a building. For example, the one on 104. And we can apply these to that situation as well. And after I've taught you these, then we have the next week, we've got seven days to uh, review them, to pray, to fast, to seek the Lord's will. So that uh, next Lord's Day, after Sunday morning, after Sunday evening, when God's had a real good opportunity to minister to our hearts, then we'll have a business meeting. And then we'll, um, we'll do a, a discussion, if there's any discussion, discussing to be done. And then we'll do a secret ballot and we'll uh, figure out what we're going to do. Okay. Let's begin with some prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for a wonderful day, great and glorious in so many ways. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us the opportunity to um, even consider putting a bid in on a building. And Lord, all we want is your will. And, uh, well, Father, have the Holy Spirit lead us, please. And teach us from the scriptures tonight. Help our hearts to be clean before you. Dear Father, I pray you'd press upon any heart tonight who's harboring secret sin, that they would confess that, turn that over to you. And not be uh, hurt or hampered by secret sin. Help us, Lord, tonight to be clean and pure before you, and then lead us. And Lord, do a miracle, any which way, either way you decide, do a miracle. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, with your Bible open at Psalm 119, uh, the first point, and I think it, it's, it's very proper that it be the first point, uh, or the first area, is the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. This one should always, always, always be on your list. The Word of God. And I'd like you to look at verse 105. Verse 105. Read it together with me out loud, please. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And there you have it right there. It doesn't get plainer than that. That God's Word will lead us and guide us. And there are so many things in the Word of God. Uh, it's amazing. You say, well, what about uh, what car I'm going to buy? Uh, does it say what chapter and verse I should turn to to find out what car I should buy? No, it's not going to tell you if you should buy a Toyota or a General Motors or a Ford or, you know, an offshore product. It's not going to tell you if you should buy a brand new or used. But there are verses in there that deal with principle. For example, going into debt. If you're considering buying a car, be, be careful about putting yourself under heavy debt. Um, there's other verses that are in there that uh, the Holy Spirit can make jump out at you. 
And the Lord can apply verses to your heart. So it's very important that we be very much reading the word of God and seeing what it has to say. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Now these points I'm going to give you tonight uh, all have scriptures attached to them, and so we'll be turning to several scriptures. Proverbs chapter 6. Uh, verse number 23, Proverbs 6, 23. And again, please read that with me. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. And so the Bible will reprove us at times and instruct us as to which way to go. And that's very important that we listen to what the Word of God has to say. I really don't believe that God is going to lead you or lead me, lead us, unless we're in his word daily. If you're wondering what the will of God is, well, should I marry this girl? Should I marry that guy? Should I take that job? And you do not read the Bible daily. God is under no obligation to show you what to do. He may let you on your own and you can end up making mistakes all your life. And some people do. And Christian people who just still, for some reason, refuse to read the Bible daily. And I mean more than just a flip, 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 and let the finger you know, fall where it may. Well, my verse for today is, ooh, uh, kumquats, and what's this guy's name? And uh, Well, okay, that's it, close. What is that? And uh, some people sort of read the Bible that way. That's a shame. The, the book of God ought to be read properly and, and with reverence and fear, and we ought to consume large portions of it. And if you just get a teeny little dribble of the Word of God here and a tiny little drip of an eyedropper there, you essentially have no right to go to Almighty God and ask Him what His will is. You, you have no ground to stand on. You need to plant your feet firmly on the Word of God. Point number one, or area number one, is the Word of God. And if you will plant your feet firmly on that book and you will pour over its pages day by day, then God is wanting to show you what to do because he is the master. He knows it all. I watched uh, an interesting YouTube and um, the world's, I believe current, I think he still is, the, the world's current grandmaster of chess is this guy named Magnuson. Magnus. Magnus? Magnus. Anybody know? It's got an M in it. <laughs> I think it's Magnus. Carl Magnus, I think. So he's just a young guy. But he's a genius of a genius in, when it comes to chess. I don't know if he can chew gum and walk at the same time. I don't know. But I do know he can play chess. And he is the world's grand master of it. Well, what they did was uh, they went to, um, to New York in, uh, in New York, they got a lot of chess is very, very, very common. They got these uh, boards set up out in public, made of concrete or whatever, permanent with all the 64 squares in there. And people are playing chess all the time and they're trying to hustle each other and stuff. I mean, that's what they do. And so this one guy who was a real hustler, they had him and they had this young boy playing against this seasoned hustler. Only what they didn't know is that in the boy's ear was a tiny little receiver. And uh, they had uh, um, Magnus Carlson. That's his name. I got it backwards. Magnus Carlson. They had him off to one side, somehow seeing the moves. I guess one of the bystanders was there with a hidden camera. And so he was telling the kid what to do. And all the kid had to do was move the pieces according to what he heard in his ear. And he skunked the pants off that hustler. That man was amazed. He was dumbfounded how this kid could beat him so badly. And he didn't realize that it wasn't the kid. It was the Grand Master. It was on a YouTube. I thought it was hilarious. Have you ever seen something like that and wish you could do something like that? Some of us do. Anyhow, just for the fun of it. Um, God is the Grand Master. And he knows exactly where to move the pieces. And if we will plant our feet firmly on his book and honor him by reading and pouring over his book every day, it just opens his heart with love toward us. And it 
obligates him in a way that he will help us to know his will. So point number one is the word of God. Now, assuming, folks, assuming that there's no unconfessed sin in our lives, and assuming that we're daily pouring over the word of God, I think we can now look for some of these other lights, harbor lights. Go to the book of the New Testament, the book of Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and I'll ask you to read with me verse number 15. Colossians 3.15, please read it now. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. There's a lot of good truth in that one verse, but what I'd like you to notice is the peace. The peace of God. This is what we're looking for. It's produced by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can produce peace. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, my peace I leave, I give unto you, he said. So the peace of God, let the peace of God, and the next word is rule in your hearts. Uh, Many commentators have likened that unto a game of baseball and the umpire. And the umpire's word is final in the game of baseball. And when the umpire says safe, it means you're safe. And when the umpire says you're out, it means you're out. And so the idea is let the peace of God be like an umpire. So many Christians have gotten into so many problems because they were faced with two decisions and this one looked better than this one, but they didn't have peace. They just kind of felt all maybe nervous, upset, unsettled, but they went for this one and it blew up in their face. There was no peace. The peace of God is a gift of God. It's produced by the Holy Spirit in your heart, in my heart. And when we're living a life of unconfessed sin and we're planting our feet on God's holy word and we're praying, Lord, what should I do? I've got a decision. Do I do this? Do I do that? Or maybe you've got a decision of three. What do I do? What do I do? Which one is the right one? And as you pour over it and pray over it, it'll take a little time usually, but God will give you a sensation of peace for which one to take. Many as a man has been spared a career, a job career, by following the sense of peace. He's had this job he could take. He's had this job he could take. This one over here offered so much more money. This one here didn't offer quite as much money, but he had peace. As he prayed over it, he just, for some reason, he couldn't explain it, he felt more peaceful. So that's the one he went for. Turns out six months later, this one fell all apart and he would have been out on the street. That's a common occurrence. The Lord gives us peace for a reason. And this is so important here, this number two, we'll call it a point, but again, I'm not saying that you should do these in in any particular order. Actually, maybe you should. Maybe you should make your hearts cleansed and your feet are planted, then away we go. But the peace of God is very important. As we're praying, seeking God's will concerning the 104 building, concerning raising a million dollars, Is there a sense of peace there? There's always going to be some kind of excitement over something new. And that's why it takes a little bit of time. Um, If you've been praying uh, over this building and looking for God's will for a period of weeks or months, like I'm hoping you have been, by this time you should have some kind of sense of peace in your heart, whether this is a, a go or it's a no. You should have some kind of sense of peace in your heart over that. And it'll only come uh, from the Holy Spirit. Um, There is other kind of uh, feeling that we call relief. And relief is not peace. Peace is often found in the middle of a storm. And the uh, singers sang, keep me safe, you know, till the storm passes by. You know, sheltered in your hand, right? And this is the peace. Many of the great saints will tell you this. They'll, they'll tell you that they were in 
tribulation, in toil, in turmoil, and things weren't looking very good, but they had the strangest sense of peace. It's because of the presence of the Lord. And I've, I've been through some harrowing things, like many of you, and uh, over the years, and when I've just sort of been shaking and crying out to God, that's when I've had that sense of peace. God was with me. And guess what? I got through. And that's what we're looking for. Now, considering the building, it's not a harrowing, shaking kind of thing, but we are looking for a sense of peace. God, are you in this? Those of you who went for a tour, you should be looking to see if the presence of the Lord was in the building. That's why it's important that you go up there and drive around it and park and pray. That's why I've been after you to do it. That's why I've been encouraging you to come and and go on a tour, walk through it. Do you feel a a sense of the presence of the Lord? So this is uh, what we'll call um, point number two. Well, let's uh, move back to the book of Acts now, where we'll find the third point or the third area. Acts chapter 16. And this is a real practical one. Those of you who like practical things, you'll like this one here. Now, let's see, we'll pick up the story and just follow along with me here. The Apostle Paul and his comrades are traveling, preaching the gospel, trying to win souls, trying to do the work of the Lord. And we'll pick up here in verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were, look at this, forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. It looks like God closed that door for that, that period of time. And uh, after they were come to Mysia, they thought, okay, well, if, if Asia is not where God wants us, we'll, we'll go to Mysia. They essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. No, that's not where I want you. They had no sense of peace. There was closed doors there. And um, so they said, well, now what are we going to do? Now, some Christians might have thought, well, that's the end of the journey. Let's go back home and eat pizza and watch movies. But that's not what uh, they did. Um, it says, verse 8, And they passing by, Mysia came down to Troas. And verse 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now verse 10, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored, that Luke is the author of Acts, and so he was there with them. He includes himself. We endeavored to go into Macedonia. Now watch these Next two words, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Assuredly gathering. Gathering what? They gathered all the pieces of the puzzle together. This third point, this third area here is is what we call circumstances. Step-by-step circumstances where God guides your step here to there to here to there. And God will sometimes do that in a Christian's life. And they, they can't go here. The only place they can go is there. And they find out this is where God wanted them in the first place. And Paul just wanted to be where God wanted him to be. He just wanted to know God's will. And so when the door closed here and the door closed there, well, that's two pieces of the puzzle, but where, where? And then in the night, he has a vision. Ah, okay. He assuredly gathers. It, it's the idea of knitting together. Knitting something together. Now, I know our dear sister Janet is good with knitting. I've seen your knitting, Janet, and it's good. She's done it for many years, and she can do it with her eyes closed or something. But she's very good at it. And when you knit, you take the, the, uh, the wool, the yarn, and you somehow knit it. You weave it together somehow with those stick things, those sticky things. And uh, out comes a sweater <laughs> or a sock or, you get the idea, the knitting taking those um, strands and knitting them together. And that's what Paul did here. He took the pieces of the puzzle and he knit them together. And he said, this is the will of God. And that's how God used it in that particular time. Now, sometimes circumstances will uh, both guide you or stop you to protect you. They say the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You remember that? And he delighteth in his way. Well, sometimes your steps, and sometimes it's your stops, as it was here. God stopped them from going here. God stopped them from going there. 
Has God ever stopped you from doing something? Maybe he did, and at the time you felt a little bit, you know, frustrated. Well, well, why didn't this happen? Oh, maybe I should have used a stick of dynamite. I knew I should have used a stick of dynamite. No, you don't need dynamite. No. But when God stops, there's a reason for it. We used to have a couple attend the church, and he went home to heaven. She went off to another church. But their daughter had... uh, a miraculous thing happened that saved her life at a stop sign, a set of lights, I'm sorry, a set of lights, and uh, light turns green, car wouldn't go. And frustrating, she had to restart the car, and as she's doing it, whoosh, right through on a red light. That would have been her, T-bone, boom, dead. I've had a few things happen in my life where, you know, the Lord has done me a favor. (laughs) You know, circumstance can be a good thing. But that's not the only thing. There's only one light. That's only one light on the harbor. You need more than one light. And so, I told you about the lady we had in our church in Ottawa. and I'd, I'd been preaching against gambling. And she loved to go to her bingo. And bingo was just a, a nice little old way of gambling, okay? It's just a nice form of gambling is all it is. And so uh, she came to me after a week and said, Pastor, I prayed about going to bingo. And I thought, that sounds good. She said, I pray, Lord, if you don't want me to go to bingo, please make sure I don't win when I go tonight. <laughs> and Pastor, I won. <laughs> Nothing I said after that made any sense to her. She kept going to her bingo. You know, the devil sometimes is into circumstances too, isn't that right? So we have to, uh, we have to be careful about circumstance, but it is a definite uh, light along, uh, harbor light. Let's move on quickly to another one. And this would be number four, and we'll call this uh, Others in Authority. Others in Authority. Now, usually God puts... Um, authorities into our lives and he does that to protect us and to bless us and guide us and we'll take a look um, back here at Proverbs 21 Proverbs 21 this particular one is a big favorite of my wife my dear wife loves Proverbs 21 1 This is a huge favorite for her. Looks like she's not here, my wife. My wife doesn't come to church too often. She's here a lot, okay? She's here somewhere, working hard. (laughs) All right, let's read verse 21. chapter Chapter 21, verse 1. Let's read it. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Boy, that's true. And you'll find that true over and over in the Bible. And you'll also find it true in life. And God puts authority figures in our lives. And God will use them to open and close doors and make decisions and things like that. Concerning that building, the owner, Mr. Donald Pitt, is like the king. And the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And so we pray, Lord, if it be your will, turn his heart toward us. You know what God has to do if he doesn't want us in that building? Just not turn his heart. Because here's what can happen. Listen, we can have our business meeting next Sunday night, and we can vote even 101% in favor to raise a million dollars and offer it as payment for the building. But if God doesn't turn his heart, he ain't going to accept it. The realtor told me that he has rejected offers of $50 million. So do you think he might reject an offer of $1 million? It would have to be a miracle for him to accept that, wouldn't it? But this is an important one. Because even if we say, yeah, let's, let's do it, let's do it, God can still close the door. Let's not forget that. That it all really comes down to one man's decision. It's either a, mm, nah, or it's, mm, yeah. 
It's like that. So this is important. Let's look at it again in Luke. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 2. Here we are. <coughs> now, in Luke chapter 2, um, Caesar Augustus is the king here in verse 1, and he's the guy that made the decree that all the world should be taxed. You see that in verse 1? And it's because of that that it brought Joseph and Mary down to Bethlehem. And that's where the Savior was born. And we don't have the time to go through the story. It's a beautiful Christmas story, isn't it? But how God turned the heart of the king this way and in that way as the rivers of water. And you know, rivers of water don't always go straight. Sometimes they turn this way and then they turn back and then they zig and they zag. And just like that, God turns the heart of the king. Was it last Sunday or the Sunday before that I told you how when I walked into a bank in Ottawa, um, the loan manager gave me a loan? He gave me a loan of, um, what was it, uh, $15,000 $15, with no down payment no co-signers, no credit, uh, no collateral. It was for to help build the church in Ottawa. And God just gave tremendous favor in his eyes. I think he may have gotten in trouble for that decision afterwards, but uh, it, was a, it was sound. You know, they didn't lose their money. We paid them all back, every penny of it and so on. So everything was good, folks. But uh, just how the Lord turned his heart for us. That was a miracle. Well, God's in control of the hearts of the kings, okay? Let's move on to uh, number five. And for this, we'll, we'll go back into the Old Testament, the book of Second Kings. Second Kings. And we'll go to chapter seven. We have in this chapter an unusual story. Um, the, the Syrian army had come and had um, made a, a, a big attack on Samaria. And uh, everyone was shut up in the city. And the Syrians were just waiting on the outside for them to give up, to starve and open the doors. Okay, we give up. And it almost happened, you know. But uh, according to the word of the Lord through Elisha, you see at the chapter 7, verse 1, you have God's word on the matter. Through Elisha, God said, Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel at, in the gate of Samaria. In other words, the economy was going to go back to normal. Right now, it was in a state of extreme emergency and inflation was... Incredible. It's like when uh, there's a big panic on the, the gas at the pumps. Sometimes they raise the price, right? Well, in this case, it would be like, you know, $1,000 a liter for gas kind of thing. It was just crazy. God says, tomorrow about this time, it's coming back down. What's it at now? Buck 50? Somewhere, give or take? Buck, buck, whatever it is. It's too much, whatever it is. And it's going to come back down to normal. And so what happened in the night was uh, God caused the Syrian army to hear this noise and they thought the Egyptians, you know, were coming, um, they were going to get attacked here. So they up in the night and they took off. And so there were these lepers and these poor guys, a um, few lepers here, and they figured, well, we're outside the city, we're starving to death. And if we, um, if we stay out here, uh, we're, we're going to die of starvation. They won't let us in the city. So we may as well go and talk to the Syrians. And if they kill us, well, we were going to die anyhow. That was their philosophy. And so they figured they would do this. Um, and so when they got there to the camp of the Syrians, they found that the Syrians were all gone. 
And so they went in from tent to tent and they, the, these lepers came, came out and they were eating and drinking and they had silver and gold and apparel and everything. They just couldn't believe it. They thought they were dreaming. And then in verse 9, then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. And so what you have here is a unique opportunity. And sometimes that'll happen. A very unique opportunity. Now be careful of this one because scam artists come at you with unique opportunities. But not every unique opportunity is a scam. You get an email from some Nigerian prince who claims that he has 7.5 million US dollars that he would like to give you so you can hold it for him till he can you know, get to Canada and the two of you can invest it in uh, uh, the stock market or something, you have a scam. You know, particularly when he asks you for a few hundred dollars just to grease a few palms so that we can get the 7.5 million through to you. And we laugh at that kind of thing, but so many people fall for that. There are so many scams going on. It's crazy. I get phone calls in Chinese telling me that it's the... Uh, Canadian Revenue Agency and I owe all this money. You say, how do you know that? Well, I recorded one and I, I played it, uh, I think it was the Don, because Don, she's pretty fluent in Chinese. I said, can you tell me what this is? And she said, yeah, that's what it is. It's a scam. Well, um, about a week ago, I got one in English. Oh boy, my first one in English. <laughs> and it was a recorded call, someone with a Chinese accent trying to speak English. And it was a recorded call saying this is the CRA and you owe a lot of money and we're going to send the police to get you if you don't pay it. Please press one. Yeah. Well, I waited. I didn't press, don't ever, ever press one. <laughs> I waited. <laughs> and uh, it hung up. Click. Oh, <laughs> I wanted to see what else it would say. But it's just a scam. So there are scams like that, lots of them out there. But God does give legitimate opportunities too. And when that legitimate opportunity comes, you need to use these other harbor lights. You need to use these other items to help determine, is this God's will? I wonder if 104 is a unique opportunity. Think about it. For, for 25 years now, that building has just sat like a monument. It has never been used, except for movie shoots. They've done a lot of movie shoots in there. Disney's been in there doing movie shoots, and they'll spend tens of thousands of dollars doing movie shoots. We couldn't get in a week ago because they were doing a movie shoot, and we had to put it off till today. Is that God's golden opportunity or not? How are we going to find out? Well, we're going to make use of these other items here. Quickly, we want to go on to the last one. And this one is very important, and we'll call it growing conviction. Growing conviction. And essentially what it is, is that over time, uh, God will just sort of bring little bits and pieces to you, and you will become convinced of the truth, that this is the way walkie in it. And I'd like you to see that here if you go to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We have this amazing story here about Jesus um, going into Simon Peter's boat and preaching to the crowd on the shore in Luke chapter 5. And then afterwards, he tells, he tells Simon Peter, okay, launch out for a big draft of fish. You're going to let down your net. You're going to catch all these fish. Do you remember the story? And Peter said, well, Lord, you know, we've, we've fished all night. We're professional fishermen. We've fished all night and we've caught nothing. However, because you're a man of God, at thy word, will let down the net. And so that's what they did. And they enclosed such a great company of fish that the net nearly break. And they called for their friends in the other boat. And they came and they filled both boats. And both boats nearly started to sink. But you can't sink a boat with Jesus in it, by the way. And then Peter did something very interesting. If you look at verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Did you, did you see it? How many saw those words? Raise your hand. How many saw something else? Raise your hand. Hmm. Maybe I read it wrong. Let me look at it again. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Oh, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Ah. Little mistake. My mistake. Sorry, I made a mistake. Did you know that after this little fishing adventure here, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Simon Peter left everything and followed Jesus, right? But now watch. Two years later. Two years later. Turn back to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Simon Peter had been following Jesus for two years. For two years, Simon Peter had been listening to Jesus' sermons. For two years, Simon Peter had been listening to the, uh, to the parables, had been uh, watching Jesus uh, turn the water into wine, walk on the water, open the eyes of the blind, uh, open the ears of the deaf, raise the dead. For two years, Simon Peter had been watching all this stuff, taking it all in, taking it all in. And now chapter 16 of Matthew, verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say thou, thou art John the Baptist. He was dead recently, by the way. Some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Those guys were long time dead. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful... Oh, no, he didn't say that. This is two years later. Now, instead of saying, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, now look at what Simon Peter says. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It took him two years to be able to say that. This sixth area or harbor light, it's what we call growing conviction. Growing conviction. It comes a little more and a little more day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And that's the way she goes. Now it all depends on how soon it is you have to make some sort of decision. If you have a year to make a decision, then it may take a year to get all the information in and then get all these lights lined up. If you have a week to make a decision, you may not have all year. You, you know, you've got seven days or something to uh, get a few lights lined up. Hopefully, everyone has been thinking and praying and seeking God for these weeks because this is an important decision. You know, when two people want to get married, we kind of think it's a good idea to give it time, right? If they've just met, oh, we're getting married. Why don't we just give it a little time? How about a week or something? And just, you know, see how you feel. Um, my wife and I, we, um, we dated for just about four years before we got married. Now, I know that's too long for some. Four years? Man, we were four minutes. <laughs> what, what took you so long? Well, some of us are slow learners, okay? In my case, it had to be four years because I had to finish my Bible college. And then with all that was done then, graduated then, then I got married. That wasn't such a bad idea. I didn't want that idea, but that's what her parents wanted. That's what my parents wanted. I was stuck. But you see, there's the authority figures in our lives. And that's what God used. And by the way, I got through. <laughs> I didn't die <laughs> like I thought I was. I got through it. God's grace got me through it. Then I got married. Amen. And it's been a pretty good marriage. 38 years now, or, you know, we figure why quit now, right? Let's see if we can make it to 40. So we, we, we figure there's no sense in quitting now. No one else would ever want us, so we want each other. So we're just going to hang around and stick around each other sort of thing. We're, we're happy with it. But growing conviction, growing conviction. And by the way, 
In Matthew 16, it's approximately one year before the crucifixion. About one year later, that's when Jesus was crucified. So, um, harbor lights, or how to know uh, God's will. And these six areas uh, are, I have found over the years to be infallible. They have helped me, helped me, helped me. And I've been using them myself for the last two or three months concerning this building because it only has just come up uh, in, for us anyhow, no more than three months ago. And I've been praying every day, every day. I've been fasting. I just want to know God's will. I know that we seem to have reached our max here. We can't seem to grow anymore. We can't seem to do much more. In order to do more for the Lord, we're going to need a bigger, a bigger uh, church building. And our next building, why don't we own it? Because we've been paying rent. We pay $100,000 a year rent here. You know, we've been here eight years. Do the math. That's, that's a lot of money. Over the last 20 years, that's all we've ever done is pay rent. Rent, 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 rent. And we've made some people wealthy, I think. But um, I think it's time. And we're big enough, we're old enough, we're wise enough. We can do this. We can get into a building of our own. Is 104 the building? Well, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I'm going to find out. I'll find out, I hope, in a week, whatever God's will is. If God closes the door, God closes the door. By the way, remember, even if we vote to go ahead with it, God can still close the door. He can still do that. Let's not forget that. You know what we need to do right now? We need to act upon what we've learned. And maybe if there's even one of these areas you've not been using, why don't you come to the altar tonight with that area and say, Lord, use this area. Help me to know your will. Maybe you've got some other decision you, that you need to make. There's a crossroads coming up in your future and you need to make a decision on something. Why don't you use some of these to help make that decision? Don't make decisions out of anger. And don't make decisions out of great joy. That's not a good idea. It's like going and doing your grocery shopping when you're starving hungry. You know your basket? It's going to be piled like this. <laughs> it's like uh, when some of us go to the all-you-can-eat buffet. And we come staggering back to the table with this mound of food that really our eyes are bigger than our stomach. So don't make, don't make important decisions late at night. Don't make important decisions when you're angry or when you're weepy or, you know, any of that stuff. Make, make the important decisions before the Lord at the altar and let the Lord lead in your life. Let's stand for prayer tonight.